This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Hi, everyone. I'm Priyanka Raghavan for Software Engineering Radio. And today I'm chatting with Shahar Benyamin, the CEO and co-founder of Inigo, to talk about GraphQL security. Shahar is a software engineer by trade. He has extensive experience working on many high-profile enterprise applications and security projects. He has written several articles and given talks at technology conferences, all of which have added to our show notes. So welcome to the show, Shahar. Hey, Priyanka. Great to be here. One of the things we've done is we've done a deep dive on GraphQL, which is episode 530. So listeners can obviously listen to that episode to understand the history and the basics of GraphQL. Having said that, since we have you on the show and it's been a while since we did that, I have to ask you if you can just briefly define for us what is GraphQL. I know it's tough, but maybe a little bit, one or two lines. And then can you also tell us why the state of GraphQL adoption is so great or whether you think it's otherwise, but I I personally think there's a big adoption in the GraphQL space. And what is the state of GraphQL adoption? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So GraphQL is merely a spec. It's an API spec that came out of Facebook, now Meta, back in 2016. And it's a query-based API and really was there to solve some of the REST limitations of underfetching and overfetching. And it's a great tool to really expedite front-end developers, allow them to move firmly, extract any data that they want in any type of hierarchy. And we've seen a lot of it when it comes out of Facebook. Um, we've seen the open source communities, specifically developers, really adopt in it. And you can actually find a, an implementation of GraphQL in any programming language uh, you might think of. Now, when we think about uh, the adoption of GraphQL, I would say that like any developer-driven technology, developer brings it into the organization. They get all hyped about it. And and like any new technology, like let's put this everywhere. It doesn't work everywhere, but it does work really well when when it's the right place, uh, like client server or we have an open API. So it had a, a rough patch at the beginning with rejections and like a lot of excitement, a lot of rejection. And now it's really finding its place and actually becoming mainstream in many enterprises. And this kind of following up on that question, you had an article on DevZone, which was titled, You Love GraphQL, now how to make sure your organization does too. So why do you think GraphQL is popular among developers and what could they do to bring it into their organizations? Maybe you have like a case study where you have, you worked with a company where the developers liked it and then they had a success story of bringing the organization in. Usually there's always one champion and maybe this person worked with GraphQL in their previous company and that's the story we see a lot. And then people move around and they say, hey, we know about this new technology and there's always a new feature. There's always a new product. Uh, Some legacy companies say, okay, it's time to refresh our stack. And then GraphQL is becoming a, a discussion. Can we do this? And front end developers, when they hear about this, they say, yes, this is what we want. So now you have the backend champion and the front end team pushing for the same thing. And usually it will start with the side product, uh, with the, some exploration. But now if you want you as the champion to push this down the org, then you need more supporters. And when it even gets to a point that you would like to productize it, what we're seeing in a lot of technology companies, this new concept, of platform teams or API teams, some call them architect teams or core team. The names really is vast. And now you basically need to ask them to own this other type of API as part of the API responsibility. And you need to have a good reason, a good mandate, and a really good set of building blocks to allow an organization to adopt a new technology. If we think about the equivalent to Kubernetes, when developers brought it in and then they said to the DevOps, hey, now you need to operate this. And maybe two minutes later, the security team will come and say, hey, now how do we secure it? We can see a similar story with GraphQL with the platform teams, those API teams. They say, hey, what is this? You're asking us to do this, but how do we do this? And I'm sure we'll break it down. Yeah, that's very interesting. To summarize, I think what you're saying, this is probably true for any new technology, right? They go through a review board and then pass it on to a central team, which then allows the whole sort of a spread of that new technology across the organization. And then the security teams come in. 
I think that probably then goes on to my next question on why is GraphQL security important? It's a, let's unfold this question. Okay, okay. <laughs> when adopting a, a free form API, which is the nature of GraphQL, which is super powerful, intentionally or unintentionally in many cases, it couldn't get abused. So GraphQL, because of its nature, it opens the door to a new paradigm of attack surfaces. Think about all the attack you can have with REST API and now add a whole new set level of tools that are specifically for GraphQL. You can see this, I guess, in four places of attack surfaces. You can think about the spec itself can be abused, which is interesting, the parser, the logic, and we know that not all GraphQL implementations are the same. You can think about resource exhaustion when you allow to ask questions in hierarchy what is the cost of such a call? Are you protecting from data leakage, which is much more open? If you think about REST again, if we take a step back, it's a contract between the sender and the re- replier. These are the question. These are the response. Very strict. GraphQL is free. Not all requests are the same. There are unlimited number of requests unless you put the right guardrails. So the same as the responses. And lastly, how do you bring these all notions of access control that you already have in your system and you bring them to GraphQL as well. So a whole new set of challenges, but who's the owner of them? That's another question. Okay, wow, that's that's great. Because it's uh, very interesting because I also noticed in the OWASP Top 10 2023 API edition, I, I noticed that there were so many examples on every category which had like, how can it be abused by GraphQL APIs, you know? So, um, That's very interesting from what you said, because I think that's one of the things I thought we can dive in a bit deep in the next section. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, absolutely. Like anything you can do with REST, you can do with GraphQL and more. What sometimes is frustrating that you go to the OSWAP website or other API gateways or other WAF tools, and you go and see what they can do for you for security. And sometimes it's very limited. And sometimes it ends with just a list of recommendations. So how do we take these recommendations and put them in play? That is a big question. And it's great in the last, I think, two years specifically, there is a lot of content about GraphQL security and articles like this are perfect because before that, the information out there was like extremely limited. People were talking about height and depth and N1, which is a great example, but it's tip of the of the iceberg. And if you really want to increase education uh, around it, more and more articles and information and blog posts are coming out there, really enriching the community, and it, which is very important just because of the the variation of implementations of GraphQL out there. Interesting. So I, I think as the implementations differ, you're saying that the documentation also has to keep up to know the different ways it can be exploited. When last year, what was what, something that we've done is we wanted to be super critical about are these vulnerabilities really exist? So we have done two interesting things. First of all, we looked into the CVE database and we just wrote GraphQL to see what, what will come up. And, and then we saw a lot of incidents. And remember to import, not all incidents are reported. Not all the ones who are reported are actually getting a CVE. But you start to see a trend. And then we try to analyze where those vulnerabilities really rely. And you can see a lot about authorization, a lot about DOS. And then you have the other classical, like code execution and injections and maybe a disclosure. So we had so much fun doing this exercise. We did the same with HackerOne, and we went to the HackerOne uh, vul- vulnerability uh, database, and we said, let's try to do the same. And it actually, the first one dated to 2018, which is even before the first CVE. And we've noticed bounties really ranging from 250 even to 20K. And that's the beginning. That's all the different implementations are coming out, and companies are going out and say, hey, can someone, we don't even have the tools to try to hack ourselves, and we need help here. This is new territory. This is new water. And for HackerOne, all of it was almost 90% was about authorizations flow, which makes sense. You don't usually go to HackerOne for someone to DOS you. 
So all those attacks are out there. And we can talk about it is interesting to see what hackers, how they do it, and we can break it down. Okay. So I think uh, one of the things I should ask you before we move to the next section is also why and how do uh, attackers hunt the GraphQL API? Is it just because the fact that, like you said at the beginning, the REST contract is very rigid? Uh, so therefore, it's is this more easier? Okay, so what, what do hackers do with GraphQL? Yeah, yeah, I love yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and how they do it? And they, well, they do two things. First, they detect it, then they will fingerprint it, and then they will abuse it. So let's talk about detecting. GraphQL, it will always return something, which is one of the biggest blind spots of every GraphQL owner or developer, that there's a big blind spot on the responses and errors. They're because the error or the content or the intent relies in the body and not in the HTTP response. So there's always response. Even if it's, hey, you're wrong, there is a response. And there are very uh, specific notions on how companies put their GraphQL endpoint. It could be slash GraphQL, slash Cori, slash API, slash Playground, slash graphical. There are specific notions that are very, very, very common to use. So nothing is preventing an abuser to go to any domain and just write slash GraphQL and send a query. It doesn't need to be a valid query. It's just sending something. So you can go over every company, any domain, and start say, hey, something will reply at some point. And you can automate this, obviously. And once you get the JSON reply, if it does, doesn't matter what is the reply, then you know. Then you have a GraphQL server or an endpoint out there. So that's the detect part. Now, based on the reply, and again, you don't need to, have to you don't need to know the introspection. You don't need to know the schema. You can just send type name. And again, please don't use this. It's very basic once you hear it now. But then, why not use it? And uh, so don't. <laughs> we don't want to encourage abusiveness, but we want to educate the the ones who actually own GraphQL servers. The response could be very different between the different implementations. One of them can have the wording syntax error, and one of them can have the wording syntax GraphQL error. So based on this, you can actually fingerprint what implementation is being used. And in some cases, you can even fingerprint the version. It could be PHP, Golang, JavaScript, Java, Haskell, Rust. They're all built by different open source communities and they all have different levels of efforts in them or dedication in them. And there's a lot of, you also published ones, there's other who published a whole table that identify the vulnerabilities in each implementation. In Go, there's a few implementations of, of GraphQL Server. So knowing, able to detect, able to fingerprint the implementation and be able to now, with equipped with all those, you can run against the vulnerabilities of that specific implementation. And that's just the spec abuse. It goes even before. So that's what's out there. So what can you do? I don't know. Don't use a classic uh, 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 endpoint so people can guess. And, and we can talk about how, what, what does it mean really to harden a GraphQL endpoint. I think that's uh, very interesting because it's it's uh, opened up a whole lot of questions which I hadn't really thought about, uh, about the hardening part. Yeah, I think that's interesting. So I think the first thing you said is also that the big takeaway from this is also not to make your, you know, the endpoints have to be a bit not so easy to find, right? I think the very first thing that we should tell people to protect their GraphQL. And, and not, I'm, not a, I'm not the biggest supporter of security by obfuscation, but... Anything you can do to reduce automation against you, it's just good practice. No, absolutely, because nowadays I think automation is, yeah, everybody's running those scripts to do everything. So I think it obviously makes sense to follow security by obs uh, you know, obfuscation, even though it's not really obscurity, actually, security by obscurity, even though it's not the most intelligent thing to do. Yeah. I, I think now it would be a good time to like dive into some of those issues that you talked about, like uh, briefly alluded to the fact that one of the things that you see in a lot of your research has shown that the authorization errors, they seem to crop up a lot in these use cases. So one of the things I noticed when I was reading the OWASP uh, top 10 API security checklist was the broken object level authorization where 
essentially one of the things you do, you have these API endpoints where they might be querying something like an ID, for example. And that seems to be one of a very good attack vectors. And there was an example there also with this can be abused by for GraphQL API. So is that something that you can just uh, briefly talk us through what you have seen? I'll break it into my answer into three. First of all, visibility, and then attribute access control, and then role-based access control. The first thing, which is the baseline, is even knowing it's happening or able ability to know it happened. It really goes into deep observability and monitoring tool that is also still a big gap when it comes to GraphQL. Is the ability to know when these things happen in case of an audit or an incident or even trying to figure out what goes wrong and what can be improved. And we're seeing many, many companies that it's a massive blind spot. Everything, all the GraphQL traffic and all sort of attempts to put in their rest hat and say, hey, I'll just throw everything to my log tool, to my SIM, Splunk or Datadog doesn't really help and really, really hard to create insights and understanding of what's happening. So if you're blind to everything, there's no point in trying to, but that's the first step. First line of defense is even knowing what's going on and then later mid fight. And the second thing, let's talk about role-based access control. Your schema could be big or could be small, but doesn't mean that everyone should see it. And the idea is, is to bring your existing notions of roles in your organizations, maybe anonymous user, maybe a member, a user, an admin, and really shape the interest, the schema when call for introspection to not to only allow what this specific role is allowed to do and enforce it at that time. So when they call introspection or when they call queries or mutations, you start to differentiate who can access what in the schema and the sooner you do it, the better, before it hits your business logic. And lastly, is the ABAC is like, where do you put those business logic that are specific to your org of who can access what specific uh, data fields in your org? Uh, if we're thinking about, I'm trying to get a specific, let's let's take a, take a Twitter or X as an example. Maybe anonymous user should not be allowed to read comments. So if they never logged in, if they don't have a job, if they try to have a query mutation about comments information, they're blocked immediately. They cannot. But if they are logged in a user and they try to get the filled comments, then you have to write your own unique business logic that says, hey, this user is user seven. They cannot access. And that is more hard work. But both of them are needed because you don't want to trigger this business logic if that user should not even be allowed to ask for that field. So you have to have a, some combination of both. Hope it makes sense. So you're saying essentially what I understand is also like have like various levels of check. So like the first level cuts you off here and then you go one level deeper, then you have another check, like the ABAC kind of check, which you said, okay. Mistakes, mistakes always happen. Mistakes always happen. Changes of fields always happen. We can't think of the schema as a static thing. Developers around the org will constantly will continue to change the schema, add fields, reduce fields. At the end of the day, those vulnerabilities or hacks or data leakage or data manipulation happens because of a stake. And so even so the more guardrails you can put, even as part of the development lifecycle in your CI, CD are crucial. And the more checkpoints that you have, the more protection you will have down the road because changes of the schema happens all the time, more than you can even imagine, especially in large organizations. Okay. So the thing is that uh, when you have a lot of checks, can you tell me a little bit, of, do we have to have some guardrails for the performance also? Or uh, is that just a trade-off, is it? Oh, absolutely. Like, it's super okay. important because <laughs> uh, <laughs> it causes... It could cause resource exhaustion or DOS independence. An attack that we see, it's a DOS attack, basically. If you get to learn, if you're an abuser, or actually it happens unintentionally, not as abusive, intentionally abusive call, it just happens. There is a change in the backend, and some field used to cost one millisecond, but now it costs 10 millisecond uh, because it computes on the fly or whatever it is. And then a big query or is calling for this. And suddenly there's a change 
and that calls becoming super long and maybe the parcel will fail, maybe the GraphQL server is in, maybe uh, the, the timeout will happen and you can cause a DOS or you just consume in so much resources that is very expensive to your org. That goes back to that, that blind spot, that lack of what we start calling field level analytics and subgraph visibility is the ability to really to trace in this GraphQL journey what is slow, what is slowing you down, and be able to have those platform teams really have um, be able to have a database conversation with those subgraph owners. Um, we see this all the time. So I think it, uh, so from what I'm saying, the observability piece is very important. So how you set your, what fields you query to provide the insights, right, to your performance. Yes. What fields your users are using or your customers are using to query things. Because if something costs costs a lot of time and and it will be asked again and again and again, 10,000 times in one query and that query has been sent a thousand times in a second. It's not hard to predict what's going to happen. Yeah, in fact, I think this was the one that also uh, was mentioned a lot in some of the articles and blogs I read. Uh, we talked about GraphQL being very susceptible to these batch attacks. And then and people are just like trying to brute force these batch attacks and then, and then try to bypass the rate limiting. So that's something, could you maybe give us an example, like have, if it's okay to talk about something where you've seen an example, I mean, maybe you don't have to mention companies, but maybe just an example, these types of attacks. Yeah. It's hard to admit, but this is where your existing API gateway is failing you. It's notion to, I'm going to give two examples of a rate limited for GraphQL uh, can hurt you. The existing tools of counting API calls, they don't, they don't work for GraphQL. It doesn't matter. For GraphQL, when you think about rate limiting, uh, you have to stop counting how many calls that happen versus you need to start counting operations and mutations. And I will break it into two things to have in mind when it comes to GraphQL. Is the first, think about field level rate limiting, which is the classic example of brute force. One API that will fly through all of your existing security tools can have 1,000 or 10,000 login attempts with different passwords. So you have a very easy brute force attempt that goes undetected without the proper monitoring and, and rate limiting in place. And you can do this the same with the example we talked about before. If we know that there is a very expensive field, an abuser can just hammer this field in one call or again and again and again, repeatedly with multiple queries or multiple aliases and just hammer this field. So that is thinking about field level rate limiting and why it's important to dive deep and understand the intent of the request and put some, I guess, tighten the knobs on those guardrails. If it's max aliases or max root operations, there's many ways to, to address this problem. Or rate limit, how many times a login can happen and if you tie it back to what we spoke about before with uh, roles, maybe anonymous users can only do five of them in a minute, and maybe an admin could do a hundred of them. So how all of them are starting to work together. And the other side of rate limiting when it comes to GraphQL is start thinking about cost-based rate limiting. And that means you have to start processing the response. Again, very unique to GraphQL. Are you counting how many objects have been returned? And why is this important? It's important because you want to protect from resource exhaustion. You also want to protect from data scraping. Uh, and we see this all the time when you have maybe a marketplace and you have a competitor trying to figure out the pricing that you have. They're just like hammering your listing. So by monitoring those heavy objects, you count how many objects have been returned per user, per role. And if you want to take this to the extreme, you can also have a dynamically assigned weights, meaning if you realize that specific queries started to be more expensive because a field, again, fields change all the time. Databases change all the time. And if you can have something fully managed uh, that you can detect, oh, this field's suddenly more important, you give more weights to that, more credits, you can arguably say, and then you can constantly monitor and keep a, your uh, health state of your uh, operability of GraphQL in a good shape. Wow. 
that's that's really good that's very insightful i think one of the things uh, to just take away from that is there's also this another attack vector called broken object property level uh, authorization so just uh, just one of the examples that what i wanted to ask i thought it'd be good to ask with an example and then take you through it because i think this this is one where you know you have an suppose you have an example of an online marketplace that offers like uh, you have two types of users like a host who's used to rent out their apartment and another type of guest who actually wants to stay there then some of the things that uh, there's usually like a call which says like approve booking to the person who's renting out their apartment and then the payload will be like something legitimate like approved is true comment is check in after 3 pm and suddenly this is one thing which i saw in some of the blogs which said that they add another entire new field to that json structure like a malicious payload saying they modify the price what was just supposed to be an approval api now just has like an extra field and then that's suddenly bang money is gone from this person right so like these kind of things can you talk a little bit about also this kind of property level authorization that we need to have yeah it's it's a great example and again i would assume it happened because of efficiency trying to trying to move fast trying to empower maybe there's an admin function that they use and suddenly it was exposed suddenly the tree is exposed even if introspection is closed there's many ways like fuzzing and others to know what really the upper option is options are with the mutations or with the query the way we think about this at Inigo, it really ties goes to the enforcement of role based access control and role based access control is very could be very very deep it could go all the way to a field level do i want to expose an email do i want to expose a name or a last name or an ssn based on the role it can also be an attributes in the mutation arguments meaning that in this example when someone is calling a mutation and trying to enforce an argument a variable that is not supposed to be there first that variable will be rejected and lastly you can also and that's another common attack we didn't talk about this which is exposed you can also put injection in any free form aspect of graphql from operation name to alias name to a variable information so how do you run validation against any input field uh, it also critical to put so uh, we've been talking like for 30 minutes and we just exposed a lot of different vulnerabilities of graphql and the more the conversation deepen more things surface and it's really challenging to chase them because at the moment you thought as the champion of graphql that you're bringing new technology into your org and suddenly you're deep into a conversations about hey how do we operate this at scale how do we secure it and you might not have that expertise in your org and and we see we, we've seen companies again the very very large scale companies have dedicated graphql developer teams which is very very expensive if you think about this but the the reality is that the first movers of graphql had to the first enterprise movers of graphql we can name coinbase we can name reddit wayfair github Happily or not happily, they had to invest a lot in those building blocks and created a lot of innovation, which is phenomenal to see. To kind of uh, take it back to so the community-led effort for doing a lot of this innovation, can you tell us any of the kind of good tools that came out of these uh, community-led efforts to find out these GraphQL issues? There's a lot of post blogs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Blog post. Blog posts, a lot of blogs, a lot of tools. There's a few open source tools out there. Unfortunately, sometimes those tools are attached to the specific implementations or the programming language they were written at. There are some commercial solutions out there. There are some free solutions out there. We're seeing, I think this is just very, very new. In a year or two, uh, we've seen a few open source attempts to create a layer that does some sort of gatekeeping around GraphQL queries. Some of them do a good job. Some of them are still early, but that's great. It just means there's more education about this. And we're also seeing the communities around them, around GraphQL implementations, starting to add a little more rules about what is possible, what is not, which is, I think, the phenomenal for those who are getting started uh, because off the shelf, they can find something uh, that can help them. 
questionable if these are enterprise grade solutions. So is there any like recommended scanners that developers can use? I will I will hesitate to answer in this question. I don't want to put <laughs> scanners examples out there for people to be abused. I would say that you can think about a scanner that runs against your GraphQL that find vulnerabilities. That's a great option to include as part of your CI CD. My worry with those scanners is that they need the counterpart. They need the ones that actually also run in your production that can force real-time protection. And that is the key of, of how are we thinking about GraphQL security, a real-time ability to address, to protect, to monitor, and alert. And those scanners, they're great as, as part of your development life cycle. But how do you get a Slack alert when your most critical mutation is failing again and again and again? And I think this is this is the existing pain that GraphQL owners at scale are uh, are challenged with. How do they know? They don't, unless they invest heavily. But the investment, do you have any examples where the investment was worth the price? Is Is that what is stopping the teams from investing because I think you gave us some great examples but they look they seem to be like you really need to inspect every field and you know you need to go through to find out a lot think behind every field that you put and what are the guardrails and sometimes that might kind of slow you down right it it does it does slow you down it's done create some resistance and it does create uh, frustration and roadmap slowdowns as engineer leaders are facing this responsibility of a new stack what we all do is like, hey, what do we already have that can work with GraphQL? Oh, I have this Apigee, or I have this gateway. It's like, what can they do for me with GraphQL? Well, very little. And then they think about performance monitoring that we touched before, and we think about observability, and, and said, oh, I'm just going to put my Splunk or Datadog and just send everything to, everything to uh, all the logs to it. And it's super expensive. And again, not every one of your developer team have access to it. And it doesn't do a good job in providing that, that field level intent. And then you start to say, as your organization, as your graph evolve, your organization will evolve with it. You start thinking about composition and registry and your platform teams will get super frustrated with developers changing things. and said, oh, it's time to enforce linting. It's first start to enforce rules. So how do you get all of this as part of your API management, developer lifecycle, CI, CD? How do you get all of this component? And suddenly you have to deal with a lot of things. What's great to see is companies coming up from the GraphQL space, like Inigo, they're trying to think about like an holistic solution that like, hey, let's connect all the dots. Let's sit very close to the GraphQL server and let's think about and this is it's a new concept. Let's think about GraphQL management. What does that mean? What does that mean to your org? Can we answer basic questions about our GraphQL APIs? And you'll be surprised to know that like, when you ask, like, how many GraphQL API calls do you have? Or how many unique GraphQL calls? People struggle to answer this question. It shouldn't be a hard question to answer. So... When you think about recommendation or coming to this, like really ask your existing tools or, or develop, vendors you work with, what can they do for you when it comes to GraphQL? What we often see is down the, not too long after trying to enforce REST tools or GraphQL, we see that they doesn't work. And that caused a lot of frustration. And now you have to ask yourself, what do I do? So in the first years of GraphQL adoption, the, mo the first enterprise movers of GraphQL went homegrown. Let's build this ourselves. But you can learn from this, and you can learn from what they have done. And what can be productized, what can be generalized, and can actually work for your organization. And you might not need all of this. You might only need some of it. But these are conversations to have with your team. I think one more thing I wanted to ask you before I go into the, the GraphQL deployment piece was one of the other attack vectors is the denial of service, which is also something we didn't talk so much. I mean, I think we kind of briefly talked about it in the introduction. 
is it is it really true that graphql is more susceptible to denial of service attacks it is very susceptible to attacks more probably yes because it exposes more uh, there's more steps in the way that could be attacked the parser itself can be attacked the business logic can be attacked and then you have the database connectivity that can cause data leakage or expose or uh, data manipulation which in some cases is worse graphql responses could leak information even if there's errors some some implementation returns the stack or, or hints pii in the error response you have to think if it introspection is a risk or not different there's two different schools for that one classic example that we like to give about the spec attack things that don't exist in rest directive attack what happens if you overload a parser with directives that don't exist and i mean thousands of them i mean someone is trying to be abusive this could spin off the parser it can overload the system and you have a dos attack even before one line of your own code was was executed so directive attack is a very common and a nice attack that we like to share because it's very easy to replicate. But you have batching attacks we mentioned, alias attack that we mentioned that can do DOS, field duplication can cause DOS, uh, directive overloading, nested queries. Things people don't talk about a lot is nested fragments. Super easy to do. And the list goes on. And those are just a whole new set of challenges that exist just for GraphQL. Wow. So then I think we have to talk a little bit about the mitigation strategies. <laughs> so one of the things I learned when I reading a lot of these blogs on the mitigation strategy was to limit the depth of the queries. What is your take on that? Can you explain that? It's just the tip of the iceberg to limit the... You should. You should limit it unless you know someone is using it. So it ties, goes back with like, are people using it? Are front-end developers actually using it? If you harden it too much, you're, you're harming your own developers from using it. So you have to have a balance between knowing how it's been used before limited. So throwing a few that depth, height, yeah, control. No, those, those uh, I call this knobs, like handles. You want to control how much people can play with this. Aliases, directive, what characters are allowed for injections and operation name. Something we love to do is to force operation name. because it kind of could hint the intent of the sender. And this is not for intentionally abusive calls, but an abusive call happened by your own team. If you have the intent, you know who's doing this. Max request size, max re request response or time, how long it took. If you see a specific query it took five seconds, maybe next time you won't allow it. So you have to also start relying on historical data to make decision moving forwards. Uh, you want to maybe block get request and only approve post request a lot of handles you want to make sure they're all locked and tied and you might have want to complete have a set of rules between the roles because you want to allow your admins or the developers free access but in production you want a little more tight that's really cool that's i think yeah these are all very valid uh, mitigation strategies that i'm seeing so just being very superficial and saying just limiting the depth is not yeah, oh, not not, not at all. Yeah, but yeah, but if if two years ago you would Google GraphQL attacks that attacks, you will only see three things: depth, height, and plus one. There's more, much more. I would see if we're talking about mitigations, the way you can think of optionally think about this is some abstraction. You have to think about the query coming in. Let's call it query protection. Does it look right? Height, depth, directives. Does it go through the standard of queries they're willing to accept? The second thing, is it accessing the right fields? So think about access control. Can it access the right fields based on the role, based on the identity of the sender? Then you start thinking about rate limiting and say, okay, are we going to allow this user who asks so many questions already to get more information or... They're using something we're not going to allow. We allow only 10 login attempts, and they're sending 20 login attempts in one call. And then when processed, look at the response. What's in there? Let's start counting how many objects has been returned. So the next time they're reaching out to us, we say, hey, you already asked us too much. Or maybe it's time to evaluate the internal dynamic cost of the, how much it actually cost us to response 
to this quarry. And if you go to the extreme and you're in a completely financially or governed environment, maybe you should search for PII in the response, either specific fields or in the error response. This is a very expensive task to do in real time. So again, you have to put like, uh, be very mindful about what security rules should you put. Now, we are talking about GraphQL as a, in its open form. This does not align with everyone. Like if you don't have to have a completely open GraphQL introspection schema, if you have a strict client server situation, yeah, those things should not be open. And you should really find a very good implementation of operation registry, which is funny. It's like you're hardening your REST, your GraphQL to look like REST, but it makes a lot of sense in a client server environment that you're only going to allow specific pre-approved queries to come in. But it doesn't, that doesn't make it true to everyone. So having both of these options to you are critical to be aware of. Okay, so it almost feels like maybe it's not, I mean, you, you started off GraphQL to overcome the REST challenges, but maybe there are some good things from REST that you also need to put into Graph. Like, yeah, okay. Okay. I think, I think that the, the notion is during development cycle, everyone should just move as fast as they can. And in production, depends on how you interact with your customers or your developer, client server, app, whatever, mobile, website, then you can enforce different rules or different strategies or mitigations uh, approaches. But And that fairly depends on how your org is leveraging GraphQL. Some don't expose GraphQL outside at all and use it as an internal a data hub so teams can interact with. Yeah, in fact, I based on this, I had a question because I came across an article which said GraphQL is not meant to be exposed over the internet. So, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's 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 a it's a fair argument. Like if you want to, if you want to strip down what it does, it's basically SQL to the world. Anyone can ask you any question, and do you want to allow it or not? And we're seeing so many different examples and companies thinking about this. The example I gave before, when GraphQL is an internal hub of data and you have multiple teams that get REST requests, but everyone send internally a GraphQL request to figure out, uh, to, to reply, right? That's all valid. I don't think there's one way to go. I question the people that say there's only one way to go because that's, that's, that's not how to create innovation. That's not how you move fast. You have to move fast. You have to make mistakes and learn from them and learn from like examples that exist out there or tools out there. We don't invent, invent everything from again and again and again. You have to invent the wheel, but you still have to try new stuff. So I'm not saying a graph, GraphQL should be exposed for some companies and for some companies it shouldn't. It really depends. On your particular use case, your schema, what you're trying to expose and all of that thing. No, and and how mature your engineering team is. Okay. Because yeah. some companies are like super technical and want to innovate and some companies move at a different pace and they want to try things out in a more safe place, don't want to make risk. We're seeing even legacy companies that used to use SOAP are moving, saying, okay, it's time to replace our stack. And now GraphQL is mainstream. It's a, it's a very good alternative based on their use case. But you still want to move in phases. Maybe not exposing GraphQL to the world is part of your adoption phases as your org is shifting. And down the road, you might be willing to say, oh, we're mature enough, we're ready to expose it. It really de- not only depends on the type of company you are, but also where are you in your journey of GraphQL adoption. And we meet companies and all sort of adoption phases of GraphQL. The way we map it is you have the ones who explore. They're just like, oh, let's find our first GraphQL project, our first server implementation. Let's connect this to all these databases. And that's great. And then you have the second wave of a uh, phase of like, let's put some safeguards for our developers and let's start talking about schema checks and maybe operation registry and maybe linting. And then you also have a phase of acceleration when you really want to like advance monitoring, uh, think about performance, maybe think about subgraph and think about how do we how do we make sense of all those errors that happen in our system and do we have some sense of health check? From there, they might or might not move to 
the intelligent phase. We're like, is there any BI in all this traffic? Can we have alerts? Can we have anomaly detection? Can we identify how the schema changed over time? And, and the last one, you might find your spot that the adoption journey does not mean you have to complete it. It's like where you are at, at the stage of your company might be fine. The last one is really governance and compliance. Like this is a free nature API. Do we know who can access what? And can we answer during an incident who actually access what? This might not be a problem for most organizations. So five steps of uh, adoption journey that not everyone needs to go through and not necessarily in this specific order. Okay. There are some in- interesting takeaways there. I do see this whole piece on the observability piece, which you said it seems to be like a big thing. You know, exactly knowing who is using your GraphQL API is how it's being used, which is uh, really standing out through a lot of your the advice you're giving. The next question is, I wanted to ask about this GraphQL deployments. Can they be secured? Because I think I remember reading this article from you, which says DevSecOps must turn the tables on GraphQL API attackers. So can you tell us a little bit about this? I, uh, let's go back to that Kubernetes example that we started with saying, like, it started with developers, it brought two DevOps team, and then the security teams realized two minutes later, hey, what is this? How do we secure it? How do we have monitor it? How do we gain control over it? What is it exposing? And really a whole ecosystem of Kubernetes security came around. So we are at the phase of GraphQL adoption that it does not need to be an afterthought. You can, from day one, even if you don't have a federated environment, even if you're just starting, from day one, you already now can have the knowledge, the educations, maybe the tools from day one to set your team for success. Because the reality is that the CISOs don't know much about GraphQL today. They're like, what? Do I have a GraphQL server? They're like in this discovery inventory phase. And when there will and when there will be a massive incident of GraphQL down the road, people will wake up. So as as you are representing your org, at what stage you want your company to be when they're going to come for you? Your own DevSecOps or your own security. How is your GraphQL security posture looks like? This is just an internal. I, my goal here is just to for, encourage everyone here to have an internal conversation internally with their own team. What is our posture? And that's it. This, a conversation like this alone will take you 80 20, will take you far way down the road than you are today. So that is the goal of this, like, like pieces, this blog post that we're releasing, encourage education, encourage discussions, because you already have a lot of smart people. I'm sure of it. Bring them to the table to discuss this new, this new technology you, uh, we all love to introduce to org. Okay, so, so the, just to get back on the, 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 the deployment piece, uh, like, so you're saying that the maturity should be like the same way, like how the Kubernetes that whole ecosystem, how that developed is, is that what you're saying? So the, I mean, is it like that? Is it at that stage or are you saying that we need to get better? Bo- 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 both, both, I guess. Both. I'm saying okay. because there are things everyone can now include in their CI, CD deployment model that can harden in their deployment, right? You could run a scanner against your GraphQL. You could write uh, QA uh, scripts that try to access fields they're not supposed to. You should ask yourself, is introspection open or not? You should ask yourself about rate limiting. All those rules, you should be able to identify that the change in the schema is not breaking production because you remove the field or because it used to cost one millisecond and now it's 100 millisecond and you realize it's part of your test development. So this all needs to happen, or ideally happen, in a robust deployment model early before it hits production. Because of all the challenges we talked about, the earlier you find it, like in anything else, uh, the better the posture is. Okay. I wanted to ask the question, like, I think just to kind of try to marry in a lot of the things that you said. So do you have any top three recommendations to prevent GraphQL attacks? Look, (laughs) first one is observability, for sure. You have to elevate 
those field level analytics, elevate subgraph visibility, elevate errors in your system. Do you even know when subgraph are returning errors about authentication and someone trying to access the field? Do you notice? So first, remove the blind covers and get intimate with your GraphQL traffic. That's the first thing I would recommend. The second thing I would recommend is the really bare bone of query protections. Put some knobs around how query should look like and what does it do. And the third will most likely be rate limiting. Going back to the, the inbound rate limiting, give rules on how many specific fields can be asked in a query. And that's a good baseline to start. And then you can have more advanced rate limiting once you have this in mind. But just make sure like the classic brute force attempts are prevented per query before starting having like a, a Redis database that start calculating rate limiting across your earth. These are like more, most advanced things, more advanced things, but you have to start somewhere. So these are the three things I would recommend. Know what's going on, which is observability. Put some controls of how a query should look like and top level rate limiting when it comes to field level. Okay, that's great. So I guess the, the last question I want to ask you and I want you to spend some time is to tell us what exactly your company does in this space in the GraphQL ecosystem and how is it helping adopters of GraphQL? When we when Inigo started, we kind of looked at the GraphQL ecosystem and we saw this like tremendous developer and open source efforts to get started, build a lot of GraphQL servers, focus on database connectivity, allow people to get started. At the same time, we saw those enterprise first GraphQL movers struggle to put this in production because a lot of the topics we talked about today, we talked about security, observability, maybe schema management. What does it mean to have schema checks and linting and a GraphQL playground or a good implementation of an operation registry? So we wanted, we wanted to innovate at that space. We wanted to create a layer that does all the management layer that is needed for organizations to feel confident with GraphQL that will work with any implementation of GraphQL. So think about it. So we built uh, some sort of a middleware integration that will work with any open source implementations of GraphQL from JavaScript to Yoga to Ruby to Apollo server, it really doesn't matter. And once it's connected to it, it provides all the building blocks you might need for your platform teams, for your GraphQL adoption to really continue this motion of journey to, and, then, and give you that, that building blocks that are needed that will free you up even if down the road you meet, need to make changes meaning moving from Python to Ruby, you still have a declarative management layer that will carry on with you. And something that is built as an enterprise-grade solution that can handle tens of billions of monthly calls that have real-time protection, not an afterthought, that gives you the composition and registry that really empowers your organization to move forward. And we love GraphQL. That's what we do every day. This is what the team is focused on uh, every day, our tool is completely written with GraphQL. And we love we love the success stories. We love to see people looking at their field level analytics and say, oh, I like this. Or unique notions of error impact. Like we have a lot of errors in the system. Everyone has a lot of errors in their system. What's important? How can we help them prioritize it? So we go deep there. Yeah, I think it's been uh, very interesting for me also to look at this uh, amount of analysis that you should do to actually secure your GraphQL API. So I think that's, it's been nice because I think you've asked really the listeners to dig deep with some great strategy on observability, query protection, and rate limiting. I think those three things, I'll sleep with that tonight. <laughs> Yeah, Love this is it. great. The last thing I need to ask you before I let you go is where can listeners find you on cyberspace? What is your preferred way that people can reach you? Well, at shahar at anigo.io. You okay. can always go okay. to anigo.io. We have an active Slack channel. You can find me on LinkedIn, find me on Twitter. You can email me. It's the best way. Very responsive. We love, we love hearing stories. We love learning from others because people went through a lot. And 
whatever we can generalize, productize, and give. Uh, we have a very generous free tier. So wherever we can give back to those who are starting or have a startup and growing, one peace of mind when it comes to GraphQL, uh, we, we love those success stories. Great. I'll make sure to add that on our show notes, at least your LinkedIn profile, as well as your the Inigo site, which I already have. This has been great. Thanks for coming on the show, Shahar. It was a pleasure, Priyanka. Thank you for having me. Really enjoyed the conversation. This is uh, Priyanka Raghavan for Software Engineering Radio. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at sc-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.